Denise Johnson. I'm a senior director, uh, architect uh, for Cloud Technologies, and I live in Redmond. I have been in technology for a little over 20 plus, uh, 22 years maybe, and um, really started, I was, you know, we're having a conversation and we were talking on our way in here. I was actually born here in Houston, uh, right across the street in CUNY Homes. I have to know my direction. And uh, we moved away when I was really young, maybe four or five years old, to Ohio, because I grew up in, in Ohio. And that is where I, my mother went into tech when she was, uh, when there were really not a lot of uh, folks like her that were in technology at the time. And so that's where uh, she was in HR and higher technology people. So she was always showing us the kind of people she hires. So I've always had this interest um, and curiosity in tech. Uh, left Ohio uh, and then came here and wanted to go to HBCU. So came to TSU actually, uh, but only for about six months. And then my mother got really ill. And then I headed back to Ohio and uh, ended up getting my first tech job uh, where she was. Where she would have been working when she was sick. So all of that led to, um, I've had startup companies, I've, I, I still have about 10 or 12 startup companies that I work with in the portfolio, and, uh, and, and have been deploying Microsoft products actually for a very long time. So every, I went with Accenture, a lot of consulting firms uh, working with Microsoft, and then decided that it was time to, to start uh, helping other companies in a different way and went on board uh, full-time with Microsoft about seven years ago, six and a half, seven years ago. And, uh, and now, really in a season that we've been able to touch, I lead, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with uh, augmented reality? Uh, yeah. Uh, Apple has an AR right on the phone where, remember Pokemon? All of you familiar with that? Yeah? Pokemon yeah, Pokemon Go, <laughs> right on your phone. How many of you played it? or at least tried and downloaded it. What was it like interacting with, with augmented type of reality? What was that like? You didn't grab the mic and talk because this is all interactive. No, oh, okay, good. Okay. Anybody want to say what that was like, what that interaction was like? Yeah. Um, and please you, be, be sure to use your mic because we're, uh, I think uh, they yeah, don't need to. Okay, excellent. All right, um, I'm Julian. Uh, so I thought it was extremely interesting. Uh, one, because it, it forced people to go outside. Um, and I guess nowadays, like, people have, uh, there's a huge problem with obesity. So, like, with Pokemon Go, it, it forced you to go outside. It forced you to walk around and go find Pikachu or Charizard. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I really, like, enjoyed the program and, you know, catching Pokemon. It, it kind of, like, made me think about, like, being, like, 12 years old again. So can you imagine? So th that's the business that I lead. It's called mixed reality or extended reality. And it is a way that we are able, I work with uh, companies all around the world. So I might be in the Netherlands working with a physician uh, who wants to use mixed reality to determine where they can't see the 2D, typically the images. And uh, um, if anybody is in or understands how you've gone and gotten your x-rays. And it's, it's a certain dimension that you're not able to see. Well, imagine your anatomy in 3D. And so being able to leverage 3D technology uh, along with intelligence superimposed on top of it that can say that as a patient, he's going to perform this type of surgical procedure. He can perform the entire surgical procedure in an augmented or mixed reality world and then superimpose holographic capability right on top of your anatomy and give 100% accuracy in a high uh, impact environment, uh, surgical approaches, and then can collaborate through holographic capabilities with other physicians all around the world. And then they can see the surgical procedures and make recommendations in real time. And that is where we are, where technology that you guys see is gaming or an interaction. And this is why we're here. This is start understanding and then we'll go ahead and get started with the program, but I wanted to keep, kind of make it real what I do, is that my world is all about infusing intelligence, uh, AI, machine learning, 
uh, cognitive capability, mixed reality. I work with converging all of those, all of the latest technologies into a single solution for very sophisticated use cases, whether it is in mechanical engineering, if you were in the industry, we call this the fourth industrial revolution. So you guys are in a, in a complete digital era where industry companies, where you think about manufacturing, kind of the way that you see it today. Tomorrow, uh, you're, you're gonna be seeing robots side by side. We're, we're doing that today, where we're infusing intelligence and robots working side by side, whether it's a robotic arm that's taking inventory off of a line, and then we're putting intelligence in that arm, and then they're working side by side kidding and inventory management and all types of things, and they're working with a human. So then we have to think about the human and the machine interacting together. That's real for your industry. Psychology, we have to understand how do we infuse uh, in these autonomous things? How do we infuse the level of intelligence, leveraging true psychological best practices? Because in AI, you can sense Right? We're teaching machines how to sense, how to think like us, how to do things better than us, more efficient. And in a moment, we're gonna talk about why, because it's not to replace human lives or to replace jobs. It is 100% to make us better, to, to make us even more intelligent in areas uh, that are safer. So if you think about mining, and think about hazardous situations that we used to put in harm's way people in to explode, a site or some type of hazardous situation uh, in any other field. And now we can create some type of digitization and automation to replace things like, you know, if you're in a smoke or hazardous area in your environment, and now you no longer have to go into that fire and risk your life to sense and see, because AI, we have custom vision and all types of capabilities so that we can classify objects and be able to see and learn all on a potential drone. So this is the world you are in, and it doesn't matter what field you're in, it doesn't matter the industry, all of you are digital. When you have your mobile and your, well, you are a digital citizen, you are a digital worker. And that's what we're really here to talk about is how is it that you have a role not just in politics, but you helped us to understand in life, what does the next generation digital citizen look like? Does that make sense so far that you understand the responsibility in the era that you're in, that it's no longer about sitting down in front of the television watching TV every day, on your phone, and interacting with people around you. That's time that could be monetized. And so you have to look at yourself and say, for everything that I do online, how is it that I can monetize that? People need your data. They want to know who you are, where you are. So here you are operating the way that you've been operating for the last five or 10 years. And you don't even realize that you are a walking, intelligent, brilliant being who adds so much value to this earth. And you probably don't even know what to do with that in this era. And that's what we're gonna unlock today. Is that fair? Does that make sense so far? Okay, go ahead. Also, I, I would add, <clears throat> in terms of getting in the mindset to to what I call think about thinking in terms of looking at artificial intelligence. I think we have to talk about the, the ethics of it. And when we look at singularity in terms of machines being able to, to have the power to, to outthink the human brain, uh, is it for good or is it for bad? And so that has to be a part of the broader conversation. And, and as Tris mentioned, you have everything you input is part of a digital foot, footprint that you establish and you create. Uh, but we look today and I think we see algorithms uh, which is inputted by human beings in terms of coding. We have to think about who's doing these kinds of things and what are the impacts? How does it impact on people differently, for example? And I'm sure you may have read about some of the facial images and recognitions. And I think Google or one of the big companies, they did something years ago and actually for African Americans that came back, some of the images that refl reflected gorillas and these kinds of things. So it's not, it's not all about good, so we have to talk about ethics and you're students of government. And so that has to be a part of the conversation and you are absolutely correct. 
its design and the aim in terms of the economic impact is to make life easier for us. But we have to understand that artificial in intelligence algorithms are being used on a daily basis to make fundamental decisions in terms of our lives. If we look at the criminal justice system, we talk about criminal justice reform. We have to look at the input. Judges are making decisions whether or not you get bail or whether or not you're released on parole based upon who you are, a zip code, or your name. For example, I, I was reading uh, not so long ago in terms of if you were to Google, uh, put three African American names in, it would come back, for example, in terms of the images that are out there, they'll come back as a mugshot. But if you were to put in names like Hillary or Josh or what have you, they would come back it would be a high school yearbook picture. So we have to talk about the disparate uh, impacts and the effects on that. We, we welcome Tris here, but we want to be a part of this discussion. And I tell my students all the time in terms of American government, we need to be at the point where the decisions are made. So we need to be a part of the hackathons, we need to talk about coding, and we need to be a part of the development of the algorithms if we're going to talk about justice. So I wanted to put that out there so we can wrap our heads around that so we can have a very good discussion and conversation this morning. Thank you, and you're spot on. You know, 10 years ago, well, up to five, four, three years ago, in order to participate in that ecosystem of developing algorithms, you had to be a developer. You don't anymore. Uh, not just Microsoft, but other companies are releasing tools right on your mobile, on your phone. Um, and if you were to go to any of them and try to say, I just want to download pre-built AI services. Um, and exactly what you're talking about is a way that you can classify images and say, I have a thousand cats. So then what happens is you can download a pictures of a thousand cats, classify them that these are cats. And then you can go further in metadata and to classify and add more attributes around it. And then you can classify dogs and say, here are a thousand dogs, classify that. And you can do that through click and drag, through tools that you have available today. And then you can test the machine learning model to say, did the model recognize some object? And you put a water, a bottle of water. Now it's a bottle of water that the cat is drinking. And the object knows that this is a cat, it knows it's water, and then intelligence bridges and converges the two together. So this is the way classification works. So if you have someone who's responsible for algorithms who are saying, if a name is, my name is my full name if I were to give it to you, <laughs> uh, or if a name, let's just say Shaquan, because I know a Shaquan, a good friend, and then they're gonna list a bunch of names and say, if this person is Ravish, if this person is Shaquan, and then they're gonna classify. Well, who's doing that classification? And this is exactly uh, what Dr. Adams is talking about, is that if we don't have knowledge, if we don't have an understanding of the things around us, how is it that you can be influential in changing the things around you? So it is important to understand your data. It is important also to read and to understand what's happening around us because you have the power to leverage your social platforms that you interact with every day to influence the way that the people who are responsible um, for, so think about when you, when you click the wrong thing, you go to Yahoo or something, let's say you click something wrong. What happens with all of your advertisements just by clicking one wrong thing? What happens? About <laughs> exactly. So again, behind the scene, there are, as Dr. Adams said, algorithms that are tracking every moment of your life. Whenever you send a text, now, when you, it will actually, Google is actually just came out with this a month ago, and I'm ashamed of it because we haven't, we've infused a lot of things in our applications, but now with Google, um, with a word, it will complete your entire paragraph practically. Why? Because it remembered and it learned you. That's what learning models do. They're learning every, so imagine you walking around collecting data every day, and there's someone behind the scene paying attention to everything that's going on, and they're creating a digital you. Why? So that they can increase personalization, 
so that they can target ads. And this gets back to segmentation and targeting in politics and people driving and controlling what it is that you get upset, what you get angry about. And that's what I kind of like to talk a bit about now. So I'd like to know, are any of you at a stage where you are frustrated at, I mean, do you watch what's going on around you in government and in politics and and see things repeated over and over again? Or what's your, I want to know the sentiment of the things that you're seeing so I could see from your eyes and address what you're seeing in politics from your eyes. Because this is not about ideology. It has nothing to do with if you're Democrat or Republican or independent. This has to do with information and data that you're given and how intelligent and knowledgeable are you to respond and react with the right reaction. Because what ends up happening, and even down to bots, so there, there are bots that literally are programmed and controlled. You, every time you see a line, somebody commenting on something, it may not be a human being. People are programming things behind the scene to control you. And because you are not engaged and involved in what is going on, you don't even know that your mind is being used. So I need to understand and get a baseline of what are you seeing in politics and in the media. And I need to know that from your, your heart and your soul because we have to deal with that in technology. Anybody want to go first? Because this is interactive. I want you to reflect and think about what you're seeing in politics and media. Think about the adults. Think about the, the maybe the bickering back and forth. What are you seeing? What, in your eyes and in your heart. Go ahead and grab the mic. I just had a, it might be a little off topic, but it kind of ties into what you were both were talking about. Are you familiar with the ghost of the machine? Not really. No. It's about how if you make the machine, you give it too much intelligence, then it has, it becomes its own person. So like as you're saying that you were, you aren't this ethical, but yeah, we've put, we've seen some of that in the bots that she's talking about. Something yeah. Like so to to give you a perfect example, and this is, goes back to ethics in California, um, and I think this is appropriate. And I'll stick above ground because this is, has been concerning. We've been doing a lot of investigation in this. Uh, so there are dolls that are just dolls. They're adult dolls. And what they've done with these adult dolls is they've actually put in AI and cognitive intelligence inside of the adult dolls so that you can sit down. And this is actually, I brought a video um, to share one of them with you. Um, it's called, uh, it's, a, it's a robotic citizen. Um, and they released the robotic citizen and she was able to have a conversation. So she is a doll. She looks human. She, they put a suit on her and they tested it and she could answer questions because what's happening is it's, there are a whole bunch of pieces that you really got to get familiar with, with cognitive. There's natural language understanding where you can understand what you're saying. So when you call a call center and they say, hello, may I help you? And you're not talking to a human being. It's called natural language processing and natural language understanding where they can understand and we can translate and put that in writing. And then we can put it into a machine so it can understand. So now you have a problem, a true ethical problem where they want to create this in politicians, where they want to be able to mine the data, crawl data from all these different places, and then to be able to create the perfect set of politicians for the perfect set of citizens. We have to pay attention to what is going on because that is when we have to raise our voices and get government involved to write policy and legislation to stop the humanization of robots to the point where you are now influencing policy. That's why we have to awaken. And, and so that's a very good point. Um, because it exists today, and then they're using it for other purposes, so we have to be very aware. 
Um, I just wanna like go off what he is saying. Like when you watch movies like I Robot and stuff like that, like how you expect us to like trust robots? Cause like the average human being, uh, if you're given a robot better intelligence than us, like you making them better than us, right? Like the average human being, they striving for power. So like if a robot become more powerful than us, how you expect us to stop the robot? If they smarter than us, they better than us, like even if y'all have a kill switch for that robot, they could become more intelligent than us and we can't shut them down at all. So they completely take over the world. Like how would y'all stop that? That's fair, but it is a movie. That's fair. But it, it so is, keep in mind the intelligence always has to still have humanization because someone has to program it. So the movies go a little too far, and that's why I said I want to debunk the myth. Yes. Oh, yeah, because I want to answer that, but yes. Yes. It's called machine learning and deep neural network. It's deep neural learning, and that's a that's also ethics that we have to deal with. But it's still learning from data. It's not learning on its own. That's why I said ethically we have a responsibility that the people that are creating uh, content, creating sentiment, creating classifications to classify data, and then being able to really write that intelligence, yes, it learns, but it learns from data. Right? Does that make sense? It can't learn out external to anything else. It can't look at you and learn. It, it will never have that level of cognitive understanding ever. It's probably going to have a book intelligence, and it'll have data intelligence. But we're really struggling with how to give it human emotion, how to think. And we'll remember the car that had a choice. It was an autonomous vehicle. It, had a, it was in Phoenix, I think, and it had a choice because the people were walking across the street. It could not determine, do I go left and hit a tree, or do I go right and hit the people? So we'll never get to a point where it can outthink us and ration, if that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead. But, but, it, but it also gets into, and, and it's not all in movies, because we can recall the incident, I think it was in 2016, right after the Black Lives Matter protest, well, the, I think it was the first recorded robot killing of a human being in Dallas. And the questions have to be addressed in terms of when do you deploy, what decisions are made, which is a human factor. And so again, it goes back to the earlier concern that I raised in terms of ethical decision making, in terms of whether it's used for good or for bad. And we can morph into a discussion in terms of deployment of uh, robots for, in terms of warfare and these kinds of things. Oh, so that's, yes. that has to be a part of the national security debate in terms of how do we defend and protect the, the country. But it's taught. It, it's taught. It's taught. It's taught. So it's, it's, yeah, it, it, it doesn't act on its own. It's not all in, in Hollywood in terms of these things. Uh, well, I meant the extent of learning on its own. In the movies, they make it look like robots learn on their own, and then they take over. And that's what I meant. They, they, the learning on their own piece, yes, they, they're self-learning, but self-learning through data, right. if that makes sense. Yeah, very good point. Um, yeah. like, you say they could never like outthink us, right? Like, oh no, they can't outthink us in data. But we have multiple dimensions of our thoughts. Think about it. We make interpretive decisions and cognitive decisions based on emotion, based on what we hear. So when you make a decision, you're not making a decision just on information. You have multiple dimensions. We have to create multiple dimensions for robots to have all of the dimensions that we do. Does that make sense? It makes a whole lot of sense, right? I Man, you don't think like that's dangerous? Like a robot knowing all this stuff and they don't have emotion at all? That's why we're trying to teach it emotion. So we have, if, we, like we're teaching it, work. yeah. So that's, the, that's where whole sentiment comes in. So you'll hear a lot about sentiment analysis, uh, you'll hear a lot about programmatic ways that we can program emotions into robots. I think that, and that was something that we talked about to deal with, there is a misuse 
of robots, then there is a good where robots can partner alongside to achieve things. Remember I said the fire and being able to send a drone in to detect if anyone is there. So there's a lot of good. We just have to work together to figure out how do we start to influence good, if that makes sense, and not have fear. Yes, and, and, it, and it comes back to, to government and good governance in terms of the public good and how do we do it in terms of uh, in terms of your Congress and your state legislative bodies. They need to be a part of the discussion in terms of how these things will be misused and even the uh, the driverless cars in terms of whether or not with the accident <laughs> that morphs into decisions of the National Transportation and Safety Administration. So they're congressional committees. So still. Uh, I think there would have to be human decisions in terms of the policy making process and analytical in terms of making sure that there's safety protocols that are in place to check things that will go amok and that are bad. Yes. Oh, uh, can you use the mic? Uh, Thank you. Wonderful questions. Very good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Adams, you, your last statement kind of laid the predicate for what I wanted to comment on. And you all may have mentioned this prior to my coming in, but in Houston, very recently, I would say the last, within the last month, there was a company that came in and wanted to introduce a sexually oriented business. Which, which robots? The oh, no. Sexual robots, right. I tried to stay away. Notice I said I'm going to stay above. <laughs> yeah, the brothel <laughs> robot house, my student. I said that I was going to stay above board, so that's oh, but I mean, above board. It, it is what it is. Okay? <laughs> it is. No, no, no. It's and so to, to kind of pick up on what Dr. Adams was saying, at some point, I think government has to step in and keep us grounded in reality, you know, if that makes any sense or whatever. Your mayor, uh, Mayor Turner got involved, didn't he? Uh, uh, mayor I thought Turner. I saw he that. He was, he was I thought involved. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, Mayor Turner was really quick off the mark. I was so proud of him. He said it ain't going to happen. But there's no policy. And he, exactly. Well, they created some in the form of an ordinance, ordinance that allows ordinance. them. City Council. Very good. Yes. The mayor and city council so creating an ordinance. The public debate. Exactly. It'll probably end up on a ballot somewhere, but for right now, uh, I think the ordinance was couched in terms that allows that business to sell their robotic dolls, but you can't interact with them or to any extent whatsoever on their premises. Well, I remember that, Just and then they're going to allow them home. to test them out before they leave and, uh, yeah, try before you buy kind of things like, oh, yeah, well. Just like any policy, it could be tested on the micro level uh, in terms of we're, we're not Las Vegas, Nevada, all right? So some things will not go down in Houston that would take place other places. But this goes back to, I have been saying that with the advent of all of these things, and this is why your generation is so special, you have an opportunity to deep think an opportunity to say that if we have access to all of these things, what is the implication? And be proactive in helping legislative uh, bodies come together and even before we face these things, start to say what does the world look like with autonomous AI? And think that through and how it impacts your life, which is why we wanted to host this because the goal is to get a hackathon a political hackathon where you guys have time to interact with one another and create a, what we call this conceptual body of laws to say how do we stay safe, how is it that we are able to keep governance, you keep going back to that, but if no one is thinking about then things like what, what you just mentioned, and I apologize your name again? Margaret, things that Margaret just said. Awesome, Margaret, nice to meet you. <laughs> and things that Margaret is saying um, are, are why it is that you guys should be spending time, more time deep thinking with one another? Yes, but uh, also I think it, it, it goes back in terms of being at the point where the decisions are made and who's there. And I think if you reflect the people who are in this room, we're not always a part of the conversation. So we need to be there. That's why the hackathons, and certainly we'll welcome you back in January. We'll try to pull that, pull that off. Uh, but the coders, I, I think they need to include people of, of colors and the people who, who, are, who are making the algorithms. It's very important because you look at a particular population, and, and again, it goes back to the criminal justice. We cannot talk about criminal justice reform if we're not a part of that uh, dialogue and the discussion in terms of what the reform should be. All right. So again, coders, they input 
what goes into the algorithms, and we should be a part of that uh, as well. Thank you. Very good point. Very good point, Dr. Adams. Yes. Um, uh, like as like if you talk about jobs, right? They have. I know. I I think I saw it on Facebook one time. They like is a robot, is a machine that replaced the employees in McDonald's. Like you say, the robots wasn't made to like get rid of us or anything, right? But you don't have to pay a robot to work if you program it properly. So like. As humans having jobs to take care of their families and stuff, how y'all supposed to, how that's supposed to work? You are brilliant. Let me tell you why. Bill Gates for the last two years, you all know who Bill Gates is, Microsoft, um, has stated that if we start to replace workers, then there ought to be taxes. So those businesses that are putting in robots instead of and replacing people, he is advocating taxes back to the community, right? So you've hit upon a very special point, but I will say this. We're really facing, when I go in a manufacturing plant or when I go into other places and we have to look at ways that, that, that AI is going to be making things efficient, but there are two things that are happening. You know, think about the old days when there were horses, right? They were cowboys. They got displaced, didn't they? When a car came, right? Think about the taxis. I don't have a car anymore. I sold my car two years ago, and I have a driver everywhere I go. I don't drive. What did I do? I used to rent cars because I'm a global traveler, so I, I don't rent cars anymore. What does that do? So every thing has its cycle. You guys are now in this hyper-connected digital era. It'll have its cycle, right? You didn't have Lyft and Uber. What happened before Lyft? People would drive home drunk. They may still do, but many of them don't anymore because they have options to be safe. So while technology has its replacements, it also is opening up new opportunities because I talk to people every day that I'm in Lyft or in Uber every day who they make money just driving around and many of them they've turned it into a full-time job they have their own company in their car so while we're displacing something else it's opening up the door for us to go off and create new innovation which is why it is critical that your skill set that you're developing you don't think about just doing one thing you think about everything that's possible. I had someone email me uh, on LinkedIn, and I, I'm not connected to them, but it said unemployed. They do work here on an offshore oil rig. They do maintenance on big equipment, and he has been out of a job for a while. I'm thinking to myself, well, that you may be out of a job for a while longer, but we are digitizing that whole space. So turn your IP and your tacit knowledge into money. Go off and create a company and say, I'm going to give you technology people everything I know how to do to make this a part because you're going to put it in digitization, meaning that when you have a big turbine and it has multiple parts and it takes a special unique individual to fix it, they now can deliver to your mobile augmented Pokemon, right? They can actually go through a cycle in 3D to fix the part, and you don't even have to have the knowledge. You're programming a machine to teach someone who normally wouldn't have had that expertise to deploy that expertise. So now you can become the expert behind the scene and say, hey, I used to work on an oil rig for 20 years. Now I'm going to work from home, make more money selling my knowledge. Let me tell you something. That's where we need to be. It is no longer an excuse that there is a technology gap for any of us sitting in this room. I barely have a degree. Barely. While well, I'm sitting next to a PhD, a brilliant man. But you have to chart your own path. I took the path of hands-on. I started tech comp I started running the tech route. But we end up right back next to each other. So there is no excuse. I had to drop out twice because I had to take care of my family. No excuse. 
grew up maybe like all of us. We it's no longer a story anymore, and we had a single parent home. Ha have most of us between the 70s and the and the, many of us. So now at this stage, that you are now getting knowledge, and I'm going to be here more often with you, because we need to get this stuff to you and let you know what's available. It is no longer you wake up, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair, you put on clothes, you go to class, you go out with your friends, you hang out, you sit on the phone all day. That is money and time. While well, I'm watching kids in India, Sri Lanka, in some of those places who are five years old, who have um, Raspberry Pi and they've learned how to build their first Internet of Things um, interactive, connected, uh, little small car. Five years old. So I am encouraging all of you today as we continue to kind of go through this. You are a walking monetizable asset who is brilliant. I don't see a notepad in some of your hands, and I don't see a pen. You should never go anywhere without a pen and a notepad and capture knowledge. You deserve it. So now we can have a conversation. You ready to get started? Yeah. Let's go. Right. And I need some energy in a room of smiles or something. How do you learn without enthusiasm? Right. And, and also, I want to go back to the young man's question that he talked about uh, in terms of, uh, he, he didn't say disruption, but we have disruptive technologies in terms of robots. And what jobs are they, are they taking? Uh, some jobs out there, they're actually the dirty jobs. And uh, you didn't mention this, but in West Texas, we see a lot of this happening in terms of the oil companies. Uh, there are certain jobs that humans are not performing anymore and, and the companies are available and I think she makes a very good point. Uh, we have, have to look at some of these di disruption as opportunities and you get into that space and you can create a company for something. And that's something that we, we don't often teach. And I think we have to teach innovation and also entrepreneurship regardless of what side of the campus you're on. If it's a social science space, but you have to look at opportunities, how, what are the solutions? And you have to come up with the solutions and come up and develop these, these apps that can make life better. But I want to go back to taxes. Um, and you mentioned, uh, I, I think it was Bill Gates in terms of taxes. And also, you didn't say inequality. But how do you get into that space in terms of you look for job displacement and you try to close the growing uh, income inequality the gap, uh, if you will? I, I think most of the correlation in the data would suggest uh, certainly it's going to come back to politics in terms of people may be more apt to develop robots or to push it or drive that industry if it's geared towards warfare as opposed to taxing for the public good for people who are at the lower end of the social economic scale. And I think we're, we'll see more of those kinds of debates taking place I agree. in terms of is it in the public interest? How do we deal with income inequality? Uh, it's easy to get a robot to clean the floor, for example. So you're talking about people being displaced at the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, scale. So we have to, as young people, have to have these kinds of thoughts and have a part of that. What do we do? What's in the interest of the public good? And, and, and I'm an old school political scientist. We go back to politics being about the authoritative allocation of values. What are the values? What are the values that would drive society? Uh, is it for the public good? If it's in the interest of those people who cannot help themselves, then you may define your values as being liberal. But if you uh, believe that the government which governs best, uh, it may be driven towards a kind of wartime industry, for example, and you're willing to tax for those things. If you're willing to drive artificial intelligence in order to protect for national security and public safety and these kinds of things. But there's another side out there. There's a growing gap. There's a schism that we see that's divided between the haves and the have-nots. So we have to talk about that. Where, where do we factor into this equation? So this is where I keep encouraging. We have options and choices when we wake up in the morning. This is a bi-directional problem. Companies will come back and say, I can't find people to, to build roles. They're right. 
but then what pathways are we creating and opening up for you to learn but then but then I say there's a third wheel where's your motivation where's your motivation every day you wake up where's your motivation knowledge is so available to you guys way better than it was when we were in school we didn't you know we still had to go look up encyclopedia we, we had to go to the library check out books and get and, and then and then we got dinged when we didn't turn the books in you know <laughs> we couldn't graduate I mean there was a whole lot of stuff associated with those books you guys have it freely and I would ask each of you if I were to ask a question and say how often do you do deep research and the reason why I know the difference is because I have a lot of young people that will come to me who are hungry doing whatever it takes and we get them through the pipe y'all it's not enough something is going on and it's not enough so we have a couple of things we have a true inequality problem that we've got to fix but then in order to fix it it means we've got to be at the table and in order to be at the table it means you've got to get motivated made motivated and demand more from folks like us so that I'm accountable to be here bringing other folks with us to say we are going to get you educated and knowledgeable because it's going to come through your knowledge will be multi-dimensional it's going to come from many places come on up you want to come up a little further and so we do and we are we are addressing um, and we're pushing even ourselves pushing to say but then they're saying okay now we want to open it up and then we don't have enough in, in, in the STEM tech pipeline so now we got all the diversity and inclusion we got all the tools we have everybody ready we got the data the data at Microsoft I don't have a problem sharing it with you it's about two percent it's low and, and, and just to, to, to sum it up, what, what we're trying to do is the touchstones of the touch points is to look at the, all the areas of public policy concerns, where there's public health. And I think the last thing we talked about is the impact on the economy. And we hadn't even talked about the diversity piece in terms of where we are as a part of artificial intelligence, or the whole big data in terms of the decisions that are made and how people of color and people at the lower end of the economic uh, totem pole are impacted. And so that's, that's a whole new discussion. But as political science students and students of American government and Texas government, you have to think about the impact of these disruptive technologies on these public policy areas. And certainly it impacts people of color because we have a particular niche or, or a place in all of them, and we're impacted. You know, imagine, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question, and my name is Joshua Spann. Um, at what point do you think that AI should plateau, like they should stop advancing? Because if they do keep advancing, they will end up taking all the jobs. Because I was reading, the, um, I was watching this thing, I was watching the show on television, and for my job career, I want to be a pilot, I'm in aviation. There's 90,000, in the next four years, so when I graduate, there should be a a job opportunity of about 90,000 more pilots. But that in context, in contrast to that, there is um, AIs that are actually taking the jobs away from pilots. Pilots is, becoming a pilot is like a $100,000 job. So if you take 90,000 jobs away that that's offering, you know, six figures or more, that's really, that's gonna, become a problem for people that's actually trying to, you know, become a pilot and work that job. These are good things to think about, but I will tell you this. So I also do a lot of work. Uh, we do a lot of mixed reality and AI work where we have simulations and pilots, robots can never make, uh, so first of all, the uh, regulatory wise, you have uh, human lives at stake. I don't know a time ever that a regulatory body would enable all robots to control lives with big equipment, with failure, with you have too much cognitive. So you're in a very special place. You have a lot of cognitive, uh, and we can interact and have this conversation. Um, 
you have a lot of cognitive decisions to make when there's turbulence, when there are all kinds of external conditions that we they have to make. So I'd love to know from you, why do you think that you could completely eradicate the human from that experience of aviation. And, well, and, and I'll just put this out yeah. there. I think if you look at the music industry, for example, and in terms of the changes that it has gone through in terms of how you make a record, for example, and, and, and we saw uh, there was a point where Capitol Records or some of the other uh, big industry giants, they controlled everything. Yeah. But now you can drop a record, you, you, you take all of that out, all right? So you, I think what, what I'm hearing, and I think Tris is, it's, and, and again, it goes back to these disruptions that we see. Uh, what, what openings out there for new types of entrepreneurships in terms of what space would go into a person like a Jay-Z, for example, oh, yeah. to, to impact on the economy where we'll say 20 years ago, it would be one major industry or one record company would control everything. So I think what we're driving, what should be one of the major takeaways today that there are opportunities out there when there seems to be disruptions or when there are adverse circumstances. So I think we have to change uh, the mindset or what we used to say would be a paradigm shift in terms I of the agree. way we look at things. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, they already have something, well going back to the aviation, they already have something called fly-by-wire, which means basically all the pilot does is steer from a certain position uh, perspective. They already have autopilot and they've actually already tested drones that can not fly themselves that's used in military use. I, and I know all of that but we're a long way away so your question about aviation and replacement right of bodies what I'm telling you you go off continue to do what you're doing and stay focused, don't get distracted by all the things that could happen. We're years and years and years off from, even in your generation, of seeing a, a complete, but, yeah, go ahead. But no, but I'm saying there's an interest, I mean, there's an industry for that. Look at the, the opposite impact. What if it were hacked, all right? How could your expertise as a human person create a job? That's exactly right, a, yeah. Or, or something. It's a very good to point. To prevent that. All right, and, and we see the same thing. We have a very large uh, port here in Houston, and I think it was some researchers at the University of Texas, they actually, they hacked into how they could, it was a luxury uh, a boat or a liner or something like that. But if you look at how that could disrupt shipping or how it could disrupt flying an airplane, you could come up with something that would be a counter to that and where you create your own business to do that. So that's the mindset that you have to be entrepreneurial. I'm saying just it's, I don't define it as, as a problem if it doesn't impede progress. That, and that's all I want to make sure you're spot on is I want you to stay excited about your industry. Your industry is uh, the types of opportunities that are opening up in this space are limitless. Yes. Uh, so you may have an Uber plane. <laughs> Do you understand my point? And it is coming, by the way. So I keep, and this is, so guys, listen, this is when I would, if you don't hear anything else from me today, I keep hearing they, they are, they. You have everything you need to be, I am a part of this. It is so easy to get distracted by everything going around you. Now, you know, it used to be the sky's the limit. You can do anything you can achieve. Now it's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna worry because robots may take my job. That's another distraction. And instead of Dr. Adams saying, hey, great that all this, happened. bring it on, robot. But now I wanna channel my energy instead of saying they are drone, they are this. How can I, with my aviation experience, go off and create the next Uber Dry, right? How can I create something at mechanics at the aviation? Because you understand the landscape. So what other areas of efficiency and opportunity can you solve and problems can you solve? See, robots are going to be here. They're not going away. And artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive, it's going to be here. We're here. So now what are you freed up to do? What is unlocked in your life to go off and be great 
at something adjacent that's going to solve a bigger problem. That is what I want to hear, hear, hear you do. Does that make sense? Because that's the level of motivation that I know is in you. Yeah? I know. Uh, well, I think you, let, let's pass back because he, you've been, yeah, let, you, we'll pass back and then we'll come back. Yeah. Sorry about my voice. Um, That's okay. I have two things. One, um, your question when you asked what we could do to improve, what was your last question that you just asked him? So instead of um, the distractions that we have that say we can't and robots are coming, they're gonna, we get all these worries. How do we ch rechannel that to tap into something great in you to say instead of they're coming up with these ideas, they, it is now you solving problems right. with your skills. Well, my answer to that was you can possibly look for error and um, kind of point out all the little things that you notice that the um, mechanics don't do that way that you can point that out to the people who are creating it so that they can add that into the next or so it continues to advance that way when you're flying the plane um, I guess you can look at all the things that the robots not doing and um, all the things that you notice that it's missing or what have you things that can actually turn into an issue per se like I, I'm guessing if the robots flying the plane it's not doing all of it so he said that you would have to steer every once in a while and, and you mentioned turbulence so I guess if the plane is not flying correctly when it hits turbulence or something then you can point that out to the people who I guess invented the you know what you're describing mechanic. you know what you're describing what is it? at the beginning we talked about your power data and monetizing your knowledge see that's a place, uh, and I'm going to later, if you go look up Robert F. Smith, uh, billionaire under Oprah, I think he, there may be even level playing field, he's the second bill, uh, black billionaire. And he's coming out with a platform called Intern X. You may want to write it down. Intern X will roll out in January. Intern X is where you can go get matched to a job, right, from anywhere all over the nation. They have big companies that are going to be signing up to this. And every time they look at your profile, you get paid a dollar. This is what he's done with your data. He's saying no one is going to download your data, look at your profile for nothing. Just like on Facebook, you have a lot of information, you take trips, you do well, you communicate, and people can see how you feel, they know your voice, they understand your platform for free. What he's saying is that every time a company is interested in you, they pay you a dollar to look at you. That is what I'm talking about. Also, You're opening up new avenues because you guys have that platform, that ability. Go ahead. All right, also, um, also, what are we thinking about the Uber Air? Because um, I know that they've released that in Dubai, and I think that they're trying to get test runs in New York. Um, and it's basically just, um, I guess, and it's still Uber, but it's a drone that flies itself, and it comes and picks you up, and it's like set up just for the person to fit in and what have you in it. It's oh, basically I love like it. a mini helicopter. Oh, I love it. I like I told you, I'm a lift person. So if I could bypass the air but keep in mind guys, listen, we have a lot of security. You know, you guys know when you go to the airport, uh, FAA doesn't play. We are we are great that we're thinking about these things. And this is the level of thinking. This is why I'm so happy that you're bringing this stuff up because this is the level of thinking you need to be. That's where you need to be. What are the implications? What are the implications in law and policy? How are they going to make it happen? You should be researching. Why? Because you will be able to knock on somebody's door and say, I have the perfect solution, and I want to be a part of your research team, even as a student here at TSU. And you create yourself an opportunity. That's the thinking that we're, we're trying to elevate you to. Make sense? You're asking all the right questions. Yes, and I think you're. I have, two, I have more than two questions, but I got two for right now. Um, <clears throat> like you think it ever become a time where okay. uh, you see like let's just say you look at a man or a woman and you ask your friend hey you think that's a man or a woman like you can't tell the difference so like you see like on the weather channels the people already look fake you think it ever become a time where you'd be like you think that's a robot telling me this information or a human you think we, it we already did it so right now if you come to our uh, we have a MTC here in Houston 
Uh, and I'm gonna see if they have it there. But we built a garage. We, it's we built it for Walmart. Uh, I think it's okay to share. And what it is is you walk up. Uh, Walmart can tell uh, based on again. Uh, there's a whole thing on artificial intelligence uh, on cognitive services. And in cognitive, there are these eight, what we call application programmatic interfaces or APIs that we can plug in. And through the classification, remember I said dogs versus cats, there are attributes of a human being. There are DNA attributes. Um, now that gets quirky and tricky because we also have a world of, of our, you know, transgender. We have all types of other things, but even that could be classified. Right? Because there are common attributes that they look at and that they study. And the machines can get smarter based on the classifications. So you walk up to this machine, and I walked up to it, and the closer I got, I could not believe. Now, it couldn't almost guess my age. It was 10 years off. But it guessed that I was a female, that I was four, five feet. And it showed, you're female, five feet, and then I could walk over somewhere and it told me what I was buying. That's how smart these companies are getting. And that's rolled out already. It's doing a demographic analysis so it can know, and it can determine personalization so it can send specific advertisement to your phone. Again, brilliant. You're thinking the right thoughts, right? I have a question for you. She's a, um, say, you, like other people saying they, 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 and people like you, um, ready to, like, it's a challenge for you, right? But how you expect to uh, outthink or outdo something that's sm programmed to be smarter and better than you? But I think it, like, it all goes what's back. What's your plan to become better than a robot? Yeah, and in the, in the concepts, again, we have to deal with some basic concepts in order to communicate. It's called singularity in terms of whether robots will outthink the, the humans. Mm -hmm. uh, but my position is still there's going to be some human factor involved in terms of the decision making and so i don't i can't really say the answer to that question at what point we would meet that threshold but um uh clearly i, I think the the controls and looking at it from the standpoint of, of government in terms of the factors in terms of whether or not we allow certain things to do that that's those are government decisions those are human decisions in terms of what point do you go beyond and i think in terms of controlling we have to look at the role of government, and I'm sure you're getting this from these classes, in terms of uh, public safety, national security, and you have to look at the public good. As, and, and I'll go back to the example I used earlier in terms of the driverless cars, for example. When we have people, cars running over people, now the National Transportation Safety Administration is going to have to stand in. At some point, they have to step in and say that we cannot do it. That's something called the public good. And so government should be about the interest in terms of protecting the public good national security, making sure that our boundaries and frontiers are protected from foreign invasion, public safety, for example, and it's the collective good. And those decisions, my position would be, will be driven by human beings. Okay. All right, I have a question. Um, so I, I definitely understand, like, y'all, your sentiment, sentiment about, like, when, I guess there's a disruption, you find the opportunity in that disruption. But I was, I don't know, I think one of the scary things about AI for me is when it comes to politics and like the greed of big business. Um, so if like certain robots start to like, I guess replace humans as far as, you know, like working, I feel like a lot of like big businesses would try to like avoid paying those taxes or avoid like kicking back money to the citizens who have lost their jobs and try to keep all that to themselves. You know? those, the, my response would be in terms of being a political scientist, those are the risks that you run in a capitalist society in terms of that's capitalism, it's inbred in terms of to be a, a, a kind of, uh, it's the last frontier, you, you, you go beyond that to create, to build and to expand businesses and you create opportunities for people. But the role of the government in terms of how they define their role, in terms of how do you rein that in? What are the protocols? What are the checks and balances that are put on that in terms of how far do you go? And then uh, it, we, we can go back to taxes. And, and for example, in terms of do you tax or do you come up with the regulations? And if you look at in terms of big business, for example, they 
they will support one political party because again it's 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 an anti-regulatory kind of party and it's a kind of unfettered access to capitalism you know and so these are the kinds of things but again it's a human decision and, and I think that if you look at the impact that it would have on, on people and governors, and I'll just throw something out, and this was a kind of harebrained thing I was reading. I don't know if you read this article in terms of over in, in Japan. It was a politician, I think, two years ago. He said that he was just going to eliminate all politicians, and he would just use data to drive decisions and make public policy Check decisions. Check so that, 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 that wouldn't be, <laughs> there wouldn't be any need for a Congress or, 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 or yeah, these so kinds Democrat. of things. So, so I, I don't know, but those, those are the risks and the perils of capitalism when you look out there, and certainly, and I use the example of the robot that shot the, the, uh, uh, the person in Dallas two years ago that was uh, a North of Grumman, I think, made robot. And so again, if there's a space, and that's the frontier of, of capitalism and the expansion of capitalism in terms of being able to get into that. And I think that's what we're saying, not just that we we are encouraging you to be budding capitalists or these kinds of things and not think about the, uh, the social consequences of your, of your actions. But that's the role of government to look in and to try to check in. It's just like with any industrial revolution. So there has to be some guidelines of some checks. Now you, I want to separate AI from robots, machines that are intelligent. You use AI every day. Your iPhone, who has iPhone or or the kind of phone, uh, whatever phone you have, it, there's AI built all the way through it. Uh, so when you start to type something and it fills in your word for you, that's intelligence, right? It learned, that's uh, part of that is cognitive and machine learning, running behind the scene. When you say, hello Siri, or hello Alexa, that's, Alexa is a cognitively intelligent, it has a whole you know, natural language, all the things I'm talking about now. So you guys use AI every single day. So separate that from what we call super intelligent robots or machines. And what you're talking about and what you've spoken about are machines uh, that are super intelligent. And that's a whole separate kind of conversation. Yeah, and, and we have talked about the digital assistants, and that's, that's where uh, Siri and some of these other things. And that could be used for a lot of good in terms of the older I get. I think about geriatrics, for example. You know, you can talk into a machine, and, and it can remind you whether or not you've taken your medication for that day. And, and the older you get, and certainly uh, we've seen the set in of Alzheimer's and some of the other things, so you can forget. So it's it's not all bad when we talk about artificial intelligence. And uh, and I think uh, Teresa and I we were having a conversation last week about public health. Uh, you can go to the doctor, and in, 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 in a matter of minutes, you can get a diagnosis. Uh, also, we can talk about. Um, uh, looking at the reams of data that could be put in from medical journals in terms of scientific journals and where it would take teams of doctors for, for many years to come up and do a diagnosis. Uh, and even, we haven't talked about a mammogram, for example, but we have now machines can make these decisions almost in real time and it actually it speeds up the diagnosis and we lead to, be, to better health and to better care. And look at the apps on your phones in terms of the activities. I just happen to walk three miles every day back and forth to, to work, but that's, that's, that's health. You know, whether I take the stairs at work and everything is built in and I can just look on my, my uh, iPhone and I can get my activity listed for that day. So it's not all bad and we, we have to think about uh, what's in the good of, of, of the public good again, the public health. Uh, and again, we don't talk about prevention and that's very important as well. And I think that AI is, is getting into that, that sphere and that arena as well, that's right. that space. But, that's right, Dr. Adams. Yeah. Right, right now I feel like we are in the age of computer assistance, but in the future we'll be in the age of more AI. So there can only be so many programmers and so many lawmakers that are controlling what AIs can do. Um, and that, that's where it gets iffy on the job situation because eventually in the future it will start taking more and more jobs. and. The tech, what you were talking about for technology and the turbulence and stuff like that, the technology is actually already there. It's already being created. It's just that humans don't trust robots with mass transportation. That's the only reason we have not, and besides money, right. like you said, being capitalist and a capitalist government, that that's the only reason why it has not we moved actually, over. Actually, we haven't solved, so I'll tell you. 
we haven't began to tap into the power of where we're about to go with the whole aviation industry. And I'm being serious. I'm, we're seeing things at NASA that are insanely amazing that haven't been released yet. Right. We haven't even begun to touch. This is why I said we got to be very careful because I don't even think we knew. We couldn't predict where we are 10 years ago that we'd be sitting in this place even having right. these kinds of conversations with you. Right. And we haven't even begun to tap into what's possible. And this is where I encourage all of us to really start to do some deep thinking and do research and get knowledge so that you can start to predict what things are coming. We're, we haven't touched the surface of where we're getting ready to go, my friend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, you, but he, 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 he mentioned a good, uh, you, you talked about the future. Uh, but I think the future is, it's, 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 you have to view it from your perch. What does it mean? We haven't even morphed into a discussion of, of education and what that means in terms of how do you prepare for the future in terms of what these jobs. And I think from where I said in terms of higher education, we have to look at curricular changes in terms of how that's going to impact, in terms of looking at smart classrooms, smart classroom, produce smart people. Right. And we have to, all this comes to bear. Where are we in terms of looking at what you're taking right now, what other people are taking at other universities, and how do you prepare for the future? And so that has to be a part of the, of the discussion. If I were you, uh, my future would be in my hands in terms of the way I see it and through those lens in terms of how I'm viewing it. And it would drive the discussion if I see something that's not being offered on this campus in terms of course offerings, in terms of a, a certificate, in terms of GIS or these kinds of things. This is where the jobs are. They're not going to be the old brick and mortar kinds of things. They're, they, right. they're driven by technology. And you're saying it from aviation science. You're in this sphere. So you should be able to drive what's being offered in your department when you talk to your professors and see what other people, other programs, what they're doing. And I guarantee you their simulations may be far advanced than what you're having. And you may be using old technology, old equipment. So what's happening at the University of Washington? What are some of the partnerships that we hope we'll make today with Microsoft that we can bring these things home? So that's a selfish. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because I, my next thing is you have all of this great, and, and let me tell you, every question that you're asking, you should be. And it's spot on. I'm so impressed, by the way. You, do you have a mentor in aviation research? from somewhere like MIT who are thinking ahead from a NASA. If not, that's where I challenge you to go next. That's where you're going to birth your next internship from and your next big opportunity. Because you have a lot, and, and this is why I said, I want to take everything you're saying and change it around for opportunity. Right. Does that make sense? Because you're, again, very impressive. Good. Right. Right. But, but also, I, and I think the civics lesson here today, and I think all of us, we're, we're citizens, uh, we're voters, and I think we should drive the conversation, whether it's in Austin or whether it's in Washington, D.C., or whether it's at City Hall. What, are, what, what, are, what is the mayor's innovation office doing? What is the outreach program? How are they tapping in in terms of the use of these apps? And I can go on and on, because I'm familiar with government, and I know uh, from crime stats in Baltimore, from comp stats in New York City. A lot of decisions are being driven by apps. Uh, the, the city of Boston have an app called Street Bump, for example. It's based upon acceleration. You can detect <coughs> where a pothole is. So all of these things. Government is changing today, public policy. So we as students and as citizens, we need to be at the point where the decisions are made. It's opportunities, opportunities, opportunities out there for you to create and to, be, to become a part of this innovation. And that's my takeaway from this conversation. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Anyone else? Because I know that we, we're, we're going to definitely come to you. Oh, no, no, no. You can ask as many questions as you want. I want everybody to be thinking of, of how to interact and, and what's on your, I would love to get what's on your minds as well. Is that fair? Yeah? Can everybody just ask at least one question? Yeah. Um, this is more like a realization, I guess, not a question per se. Uh, there might be a question. Um, I feel like the the fear is coming for like the fear in the citizens um, is coming from mainly the fact that everything's hands free um, and the difference between normal technology and artificial intelligence because cell phones when they first came out they were basically just a brick that stored things so they would store your pictures and store your numbers and then call whenever you chose to call and now they've got cell phones where you can 
click on your phone and it opens just because of your face and you can talk into it and it'll type out your text messages and what have you. So I feel like that's where the fear comes because you said that there's a difference between super intelligence and I guess just AI. Um, so I feel like once the super intelligent um, robots start being able to do things that require us to be hands free or not involved whatsoever, that's where the fear comes. What's in interesting, so you just described my world. I, I'm over mixed reality. That's the business uh, architecture practice that I lead. And so my world is all about heads up, hands free. We have, if you've never seen HoloLens, you can go take a look at it later, HoloLens. Um, it's, um, it's called mixed reality. It's not VR technology. It is extended reality technology. So you can imagine being a mechanic in a big turbine and instead of having to open up a manual to try to figure out how to get fix a big part, uh, instead of knowing where your inventory is, picking up the phone call in the control room to say, is the part available? Basically, it is a 3D image of every single, the part explodes out and it will tell you this part is in inventory because it's pulling data from all of these systems to give it all to you and superimposes that data the way that you would see it on a Pokemon Go. Yes, that is what we want. Why? Because it keeps that person safe. That company now doesn't have to fly in a person that they normally used to because you can hollow port people. Physicians is one place. Uh, and, and when we come back, we'll be able to show you more of this. But you can hollow port a physician to where a physician is sitting right here where I'm sitting, put on this hollow lens. Patient in another country can put on their hollow lens. And then you see imagery, whether it's x-rays, whether it's whatever that looks like. You're all in one single environment talking to each other one-to-one. -one. That future is here now, hands up, heads free, all mobile enabled technology. And they're going to go further with that. So I just want you guys not to be afraid because you, I have a job because of that. And, and, and so there are other jobs now being birthed. And that's what Dr. Adams keeps saying is you got to look at the other things. And, and we, we haven't even broached the subject of cybersecurity. And I, and I think that's a whole new industry that we've talked about some of the fears that, that you may have in terms of things being hacked in. And we know that our monies, monies are being managed in terms of things are being locked and people can hack into it and just empty a vault and what have you. So, so that's a whole new industry. So that's well, what are we doing in terms of majors? And you know, that's, that's something that we should be doing here in terms of looking at cybersecurity you know, as a field that we can go into. So again, it's disruptive technology, but also, again, it presents a lot of opportunities for us. I'm going to say something because I want to make sure. No, I was wondering if you wanted to take a break. Now we've been going for an hour. Do you want to Before show the video yes. and come back? Uh, do you guys, actually, I could prepare a few of these videos and put them back to back so you guys can see the world in real time. Uh, what do you want to do? We could take a quick break, uh, Dr. Adams. So, uh, and then we can come back with more questions. Is this keeping you interested, awake? Are you, is, are you learning or? Or do you guys want to do the videos? It's up to you. Would that help? Let's see the video. Uh, that's one more question. Take a break. Let's do. Okay. okay. Are y'all okay? I'm good. If we can show the video and just go through it. Yeah. You get. You guys want to keep asking questions for a few more minutes? Because it sounds like you still want to keep going. You're excited. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, give her the mic real quick, Margaret. Yes, Margaret. What they're doing in China, where they're identifying people like, on the streets, where they can watch your movement all day long or whatever. Are you familiar with that? It's so scary we, to me. We, we can do that. We can do that almost here. So they're counterterrorism. Um, it's all about counterterrorism. And there are places I probably can't name yet uh, because some of those are under confidentiality. Mm -hmm. But there are cities that you can go to today uh, who have been um, where terrorist acts have taken place. Mm -hmm. What happens is they leverage what's called biometrics uh, and cognitive. We keep kind of going back to the way that you can do facial recognition. Right. And so then they could tap that into databases to see. Uh, so then it, it all becomes data, like you said. It's digitization of data where they're looking at every database. The other thing that it could do is we haven't even touched the IoT yet, Internet of Things, which is the mayor's big initiative here. That's why keep, we keep saying there's so many opportunities for all of you. But the Internet of Things allows us that when even you detect a person and they have a bag, we can see content uh, of things 
uh, and sense things. So there are radar. Uh, so you think about uh, radiation and think about the ability to be able to sense a bomb in somebody's bag when they pass the camera. So not only can you see, detect something, you can also detect some radi things coming out that are not natural to the environment. So now you have a whole nother big opportunity. So this isn't just happening in China. I could name a couple of big cities. You know, that I think that's great in terms of <laughs> detecting terrorists or whatever. I love it. But in terms of catching me without my makeup one morning, I don't like that. It just, it just seems like it's such an invasion of your privacy, though. You know what I'm saying? It goes back to privacy that, that this is exactly what Dr. Adams said. While I'm excited that I'm going to be safe, that I don't do anything wrong, exactly. but now they have it even where you can shoot a gun, and it will know through the cognitive capability gunshots, it knows exactly where the shot came from. And you can now get the perpetrator in seconds when normally you couldn't do it. So I, as a citizen, I don't care if they detect me, I feel safer, but others are, this is exactly what, what Dr. Adams keeps saying. This is the big debate. My daughter it's and I were talking privacy. about this the other day, and I know everybody experiences this, but I'm not tech savvy, Dr. Adams. But you're doing good. <laughs> but, you know, I can, she and I were talking about this. You can go on your computer and maybe you just look up a word or whatever. Let's say if I look up haute couture, you know, the high-end designs, whatever. Then, the, then within seconds, I've got all these ads from Christian Dior, Valentino, who I cannot afford, you know. But just because I entered Hoot Couture, then here comes all of the multi-million dollar designer. It just seems like there's just, we just, with all this technology, we're losing something as we, as we embrace it, as we go. Mostly we're, we're losing. I don't want anybody in my mind, in my head, telling me, oh, this is who you need to be shopping with. Yeah, that, that gets into a, a, another discussion because, again, in marketing, and I just know that from personal yeah, experiences yeah. Mm -hmm. in terms of your place, in terms of how you get to be on Google and whatever, and there's a whole debate out there in terms of monopoly of right. uh, the types of ads in the, in the stores. They know your spending habits, your trends, and stuff like that. So that's, again, it goes back to capitalism, and that's the market that's, that's, that's driving uh, a lot of that. But the other question in terms of uh, is the big brother, in terms of their watching, and again, is it for good or bad? But we, we live in, a, in an era, I think, in terms of national security concerns, in terms of public safety. And you can imagine some of the larger cities that, you know, that we have uh, vulnerabilities here. We have a very large port. And certainly, uh, they're, they're out, there are people out there all the time uh, looking to do to, to do bad or to do evil. Yeah, I but, think but again, but cybersecurity gets into, again, going back to the aviation, the student. I'm, I'm really impressed with your, your interest, and I think that should drive a lot of other decisions. And, and some of these other things I'm just throwing out there, and I know in terms of education and our speed, in terms of higher education, there's some things that we should be offering that we're not offering, but it, it prepares us for the future. So that shouldn't be, we don't want to take away today to be that all of the jobs are going to be displaced and what are the robots are, are doing there in artificial intelligence. But it's to make society much better. But again, we should be at the point where the decisions are made. We should drive the coding. Uh, we should be a part of the discussions. I look at commissions that are out there. They include everybody, but they don't include people of color. Like right. we're, we're not out there, but these are the people who are going to be driving the regulations, doing the studies that Congress are going to read, that will have the input in terms of becoming public policy decisions. We should always think about being at the point where the decisions are made, right? And again, you're, you're all people, the politicians, I, I feel that I'm always loved around election time. I get all of these calls, people, they, they, they're asking me to vote and whatever. Yes. <laughs> but when it comes time to, to listen to problems in terms of public policy decisions, you know, they only come back when the elections are there and then they forget about us. As good citizens, and I think the civic le lessons today is to always to have your input, have your voices heard. And, and AI is very important. Uh, big data is driving a lot of things from your public safety, uh, just from hot holes and everything. City government is being run by that. And, and I don't want to forget the day, but I want to throw out data.gov. It's just everything is up online from, from the federal government. 
uh, the state of Texas will have a data portal, just about everything that will impact your lives from a state point of view, where this license is something that you need to know in terms of just doing research. The city of Houston has a data portal. They collect data and information in just about everything. So as students, and, and I'm always a student, so you never stop learning about things. There are always opportunities. And so that's the mindset that I try to get the student body to, to think about at Texas Southern University. You're spot on. And, you know, Margaret raised the best point because that's the dilemma that you now are a digital copy, a digital copy of your behavior, yes. a digital copy of the way that you move throughout your moment. And the moment you make a move that you just have curiosity, then they make that curiosity who you are to your core. Think about the power now of leveraging that same platform for segmentation and framing a political landscape. It gets even more interesting. I want to say scary. Because now they're able to segment and say, because you like these things, because you do these things, I now can come in and I want to draft a bill that likely you're going to support. Because I've been watching and I paid somebody for your data. I paid someone. Um, that goes back to the, the, the company, uh, Cambridge, that uh, Analytica, uh, that, uh, that it, that's at the center of a whole lot of controversy now. And guys, there may not be a pure solution to all that you are seeing, but what you look at is you say, if someone has a price and they're paying a price, why not set up a site or some app that now, every time somebody gets some information about you or they look you up, that you're the one getting something out of the... F See, I don't have a problem with my data. As long as my social... My social's probably out there. Probably everything is, out, everything is out there, guys, by the way. I probably don't have a big problem with people knowing what I do, what I like, and my behaviors. Because then a lot of personalization comes, so you get a lot out of it, right, by a lot of good. The danger comes is exactly what you're saying, is machines can't, don't have any logic, so you can click the one ad, you can mistake, make a mistake, and then they would assign that to your identity. How do we resolve those challenges and get Yahoo on board and others on board to say, can I have an end capability that when I put something out there, or when I click something, that I have a control panel where I can determine who I am and who I want others to know who I am. I, I don't know if anybody has created that yet or if they've gone to some of these social media platforms to say, I want to reinvent myself from who I was three or four years ago. Yes, yeah. You can, you can take, no, wasn't this question. is an interactive, yeah, yeah um, this is highly interactive. I actually just redid all my social media because I'm trying to get my portfolio started for my modeling career, so that's why I was like, Very me. good. But um, I wanted to bring up this, um, so in, I forgot which country it is where they started implementing this, but they're doing this microchip where they put it in people's hands and um, it's mainly for people of offices so that they can get into padlock doors and what have you like all the security locked doors you would have a chip in your hand per se to where you can access everything that you would have a security code to um, so that being said um, I also heard about AI being um, put in humans for like advancement um, this is like way on into the future I guessing but um, I'm guessing since they're considering putting AI I guess advancing us so adding artificial intelligence to our current brain that way we would have all the data information as well as our emotions and psychological thoughts um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that and if that was ever going to be a thing because they're already comfortable with putting technology in people with the microchips. So I was just trying to see what y'all thought of that, if we would ever have to advance as a human race due to um, how advanced our robots become. I definitely don't have enough information about AI inside of the human brain to 
augment and make the brain even more powerfully intelligent. Um, and I'm not even sure how I feel about that. I think uh, we're all about getting more knowledge, more information. I think that again, it goes back to everything you were saying is purpose. What is the purpose, having a purpose for all of that, right? And what's the purpose in achieving that? And I would like to know more about how it's being done uh, because uh, yeah, I would like to know how. I have to read up on that to see how they're achieving that. Right. Like what mechanism? I, I do know that the microchips are already in effect, though. That um, they have been putting those in people. I don't remember which country it is. Right. I, it might be Dubai because Dubai has everything early. But um, I just I've noticed that they're comfortable putting technology in people already. So if it was possible to advance human beings, if our robots become. I've seen the microchips advanced. and I've seen all of those, but as far as being able to impact the brain, which is a very sensitive area, I'd love to know more about how they're able to impact the brain. Right. The, yeah. I know that they're considering it. I don't know if they're. No, but this is good because you're educating. Again, this is bi-directional. I appreciate this so much, yeah, because it gives us. Yeah. I mean, with that, with that, I see where you're coming from because they give you, they give you two options: is either to put it in your hand or put it in your head. Yeah, but as far as it propelling or infusing greater intelligence coming from where you got to remember, intelligence has to have information which means that the chip has to be connected somehow to a Wi-Fi, to a cloud, to something to get the data. So I would have to learn more and understand uh, because you can't get data offline uh, without it. Yeah, like go ahead. With that chip, it, it know when you born, it know your, yeah, 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 your bank statements, it know the last thing you bought, it know everything about you. So we would have to, yeah, I'd have to do some more investigation. I think that's pretty, pretty but, unique. But <laughs> I have a question. Like, they have, like, the artificial intelligence, they have, like, this technology where it could actually print food, like, you type in whatever you want and it print it out. And, like, let's just say you, and let's just say you in the food, fast food business. Like, if you have a, a robot out there that could print food, or you have a robot out there who will take your job in pharmacy, mixing medicine and stuff like that, if you in this field, if you in the, let's just say the small food businesses or the small pharmacists, like, you, you there saying stay hungry and stay motivated and stuff like that. Like, if you know uh, artificial intelligence could print food and they about to knock out your small business and um, you in the pharmacy business and you know like uh, artificial intelligence and they'll mix, all you gotta do is press a button and it mix the medicine for you. Like, how are you supposed to stay, how would you stay motivated and stay hungry knowing that a robot out there completely wipe out your job? Yeah, but, but my response again, but those would be decisions made by, by the government in terms of if, if you have, if it's a staple crop, if it's agriculture, for example, and you're going to lay off an industry or something like that, and I'm, I'm sure that the government would be somewhat careful to enter into a foray of eliminating a, a crop. But again, to make life safer, to make life uh, better, uh, we haven't touched upon globalization and the impact of that. We haven't talked about emergency. We have a, a, a program in our school called Emergency Management, Homeland Security, for example. And I think back to Katrina in terms of when everybody didn't have a cell phone and they weren't able to get out and they wouldn't get that now. And I was down in Brazil about a week ago in terms of the use of drones for crowd control and these kinds of things. So the technology is, is, is there, but some of the things, inputting chips and what have you, uh, we, we do have a, 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 a system of laws, Margaret, in terms of, in terms of public debate, in terms of uh, civil liberties, in terms of protecting that, how far would you go? And I think in the public domain, in terms of the discussion, that, that would be, and I think as Americans, uh, uh, we're not as uh, autocratic in terms of saying these kinds of things. So certainly that would be push up. That, that's still an arena in terms of where the free flow of ideas, in terms of public policy is, is debated. Uh, there are also, uh, there are courts, there are, there are laws, and the government is, again, should operate in the interest of the public good. 
uh, does it impact on the public good? Do you give your privacy away for these types of uh, civil libertarian protections, for example, to be coded or to put something in your brain? And, and, and again, I believe in that the singular, singularity revolution is coming in terms of where we have these smart machines and everything like that. But still, you have to look at in terms of how government works and how it all and, and And HIPAA and all those are still, so we're, we're a ways away. Uh, that's all I'm going to tell you, we're a ways away. Stay focused and stay excited. We are a ways away. We have a lot to figure out before a robot could just get somebody's medicine. They have to be able to get through a whole host of systems. They have to be able to positions that have a, how do you know the signature from a real physician? There's a lot that has to happen before you can even start filling medication. There's a whole validating insurance. So this is why I say knowledge. Yeah. Look at the full value chain. Exactly. Look at the entire cycle of everything you're asking and say what is it going to take in order to realize this and make it real? Those are the questions. You know why? Because you may birth the business out of this and say, you know, I'm going to deal with this discrete part of the value chain because of what I know is coming down the pipeline and I'm going to start a company that's going to go off and do this. That's the level of thinking. Because here's what I don't want to see happen anymore. And I hope we make an agreement before we leave here today. Yes, technology is coming. And yes, it may replace things. And yes, it will transform our lives. But you've asked good questions about what, is, what policies need to be in place in order to realize and make it true. And then get rid of the fear. That's the key is get rid of the fear. And Embrace it. And, and I was going to say, we have to think of it in terms of being forces of good. You know, what about, uh, you know, eliminating world hunger, famine, these kinds of things if you use these technologies. And, and, and that's, that's, that, that, that's the lens I would look at it. That's exactly right, and those are the things you look at. And then you think about augmented reality, 3D technology, that then can take all the contents of a building. It would even know the drone could know the construction site, what, what materials are at the site, do you need inventory? And then a conversational back-end platform, the bot, could go off and say, okay, this person's going to run out of this inventory in this time. And now you can build a construction site much faster. So this is, what we keep saying is there's good, but then we need to mine the things that are important as the ethics and governance, which I love that you keep bringing governance oh, back into sure. this. Um, I hear you saying don't really worry about it and stay open, but this is going to happen in our near future. Like, Am I saying don't worry? Well, you, you're saying that keep your eyes open and be excited, but this is going to happen in our near future where it's possible that we can only have three types of jobs working. That would be big business, which would probably be the higher class. Middle class would probably be coders and um, coders and programmers and things of that nature. And then it would be a lower class of people who have no jobs because there are no jobs left. But I'll tell you this, so my friend, listen, we have that problem today. We have a class of people that, that I pass them every day that are struggling now. So here's what I encourage. And I think this is what I'm saying more than anything. <clears throat> you guys have an opportunity with, the, with all this knowledge that, that you have in your hand to either look at what's happening with glass full or glass empty. It's a choice. I don't know if I agree that there are going to be three classes. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing jobs that are exploding, that are coming open, that many people can't even fill by the time we get to 2030 and 2040 and 2050. And there's a huge gap to go after. And I think that is probably what I'm saying most. I'm probably saying not to worry. Number one, worry is not going to fix anything, number one. I, it, it never does it, I, in my lifetime. I don't know. Not telling you not, but you have some concerns in the back of your head. What we're challenging you to do is translate your fears into positive action for your life, for your family, and for your community. Guys, listen, th that's this is a conditioning problem that we have. 
beyond everything else, you get up, you go to class every day, you do what the things that you're doing to live your life. If we don't mentally start to recondition our minds that instead of seeing things as it's either the end of the world or things happening, we're going to get replaced, you, you have to reset your perspective and get context and get knowledge, research, and then understand your role. And once you do that, when I come back next time, I guarantee I'm going to hear another set of questions from you guys. Because it's not about not worrying. It's about translating each and everything in your capability that you have into what's possible. And if you start every time that doubt kicks in and you say, oh, robots uh, could replace, then you turn around and say, what am I going to do about it in the realm of my capability? And how is it that I can reset a new trajectory? And that level of interaction, we got to have that more often than, than all the fear. Does that, does that make sense, what I'm saying, a little bit? Because I don't want to smush what you're saying or shrink it down. It's important. But I want to show you a new perspective of innovation. Innovation doesn't live here in this place. Purpose does not live in fear. For you to realize your greatest potential and your purpose, you've got to stand up to whatever is in your head telling you something different, and then you got to face it and say, today you may be telling me that there might be AI, robotics, and all these things that might be, but I'm going to stand here and tell you what I'm going to do about it, which means that instead of you focused on that distraction, you open up your life and your mind to unlock something much greater in you so that you can deep think for solutions. That's where we want you to be. Yeah. Uh, oh, can I have a qu uh, ask a question real quick? Um, so basically, I want to know what's happened in like the past year that has... I guess, I guess some sort of opportunity that you feel that has developed within the past year as far as like AI. And then also another question is, what do you think we can do as far as like say we aren't as tech, tech savvy, like what do you think we can start to do now to like position ourselves, I guess so we can be involved in this AI world, in this augmentative reality world. You've got to get connected and mentor. Go ahead. Yes. I, I no, no, go the, right ahead. I, I would like to take the yes. uh, a shot at that one by starting from what we should do in terms of, I think, one, we should look at ourselves where we are globally in terms of education and what other societies are doing and also looking at our industries in terms of how rapidly we're changing in terms of we look at the electrification of cars for example as you know we went from these big old heavy battery type cars and getting them charged but now we look in some of the nordic countries they have rails and that can charge the cars and where we are what positions with in, in terms of because we have to talk about global competition and because they're looking at i think their benchmark in the year 2035 by saying that their uh, economies will, will double double where does that leave us in terms of americans and what does it portend in terms of what we allocate for public education and looking at, and I go back to the concept in terms of smart classrooms, at least create smart people and these kinds of things. So we have to make investments if we're gonna be competitive. And it's not about, all about us in terms of these individualized fears that we have. We have to think, and the reason why I think about government, because again, I'm a political scientist by training and I understand the roles of government. We have to talk about the public good because I can't sit over here in a gated community and have all minds and think that I'm going to ride out freely and not get knocked in the head or jacked because if I'm neglecting others in our society. So we have to look at the best interests of the public good in terms of these kinds of things. So I, I, I would look at uh, globally where we are and how far are we improving in terms of education, looking at the commitment in terms of elementary secondary education, K through 12, we're, we're losing out, we're losing people. Uh, if we're not educating them, uh, there's a prison uh, pipeline, for example. So we have to talk about training. How do we retool? We cannot just write ourselves off or out of the game in terms of losers. How do we get back into the game in terms of how do we understand what we need to do to improve upon our communities? All right? And I think the mayor, he calls them complete communities. And how do we make ourselves whole? 
and looking at AI and look at other types of technologies where we can train people from warehouse jobs to other type of moving things and different types of mobility and trains and transportation is another whole avenue. And Dr. Adams is right, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, guys. You have to go where all of this lives. You have to connect yourself to people who are in it every day, and then connect yourself to people who are knowledgeable about the, every single area that is going to impact us. I keep asking the same question, who is your mentor? Because your mentor is going to pick up the phone, you'll have a call with that person, you'll interact with that person and say, I'm a photographer, here are the things that I do best. And I'm going to ask questions, or your mentor is going to ask questions and say, do you have all of your work online? If you don't have all your work online, are you using tools where people can reach you? And are you using tools where you can segment people that need you? Do you have a brand? Do you have a plan to go after the market? Are you leveraging all the tools and capabilities around you so that you can stand up a site so people can interact with new ways of working? Are you connected to a developer community? Are you down at WeWork? Are you down at the startup experience? accelerator downtown that that stood up and are you working with other entrepreneurs that are developers and making friends are you extending your network or are you around the same people every day doing the same thing every single moment of your life you have to change and that is the number one thing that I say I hopped on the plane two weeks ago because I said I want to meet uh, an individual I wanted to meet the billionaire myself I found a ticket found a way pressed on, hopped on a flight, and then made my way up to him to say, I just need five minutes of your time. He couldn't give it to me. That's like walking up to Oprah to do the same thing. It won't happen. But if you don't go meet purpose where it is, and if you don't take the time to look at the assets around you and then connect, my email box probably should be a little full from people saying, I need 20 minutes of your time to innovate. I have an idea. I have one opportunity. I'm ready to get out of this mind rut that I've been in because people keep telling me no that I can't do this and you need to be around people that are going to tell you your potential is limitless no different than what we've been saying here but then you have to put it to action nothing is going to come to you nothing and so if you're ready to change and you're ready to take advantage and exploit it's not just about artificial intelligence there is a whole nother world out here we haven't even approached blockchain we haven't even approached digital twin where we're able to take digital replica of, of assets of the world and be able to drive information and data right at the edge where I can take an asset that's not smart at all, like a refrigerator, and then I'll know uh, based on a barcode and information, custom vision, where you are with your milk. I can actually understand if your milk is almost out, report back to the uh, Costco and say that he's going to be in to buy milk probably in the next two days because he has six kids and they need milk. They probably need about three or four gallons. And I could take that all the way back to the cow that produced it. This is the world we live in. And if you think that you don't have a place and a role, mechanical engineering, all of that, 100% everyone in this room has a role in an entire digital ecosystem. The key is you've got to surround yourself with mentors, with sponsors who are working in this space. You have a host of companies here and you've got to get out of your shell because we will all help you and people will help you. But you got to daggone well be motivated to come out of your shell and help yourself and come to people with positivity, a good heart, I will tell you that it wasn't until I really started to understand the world in a different way and have compassion and empathy and care, technology was meaningless because now I can solve problems, accessibility, you know, a lot of the things you keep talking about with governance, you've got to be able to see and I see you have to have a good heart. So you've got to get rid of a lot of the distractions, the negativity, be a kind person and a good person. And I'm telling you, you will attract beautiful people. That is what has changed my career over these last seven years. It's just being good. Walking up to people and say, hey, can you help me? Because I want to see what you see. I don't longer want to see the world the way I see it. Because if I woke up every day and saw that world, you wouldn't have me sitting here. If I feared, I fear nothing. And that's the level of, of, of capability and heart that, and grit that you have to walk up to, to every day. Does that make sense?
makes a whole Absolutely. lot of sense, and, and I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, it's, it's like sometimes we have this trepidation with this fear of failure, and you cannot be there in terms of given the nature of innovation and, and the movement in our society. And you didn't, you didn't say it, but we have to be able to adapt to a sharing economy. We have to be able to adapt to a gig economy. The world is changing. And you should ask yourselves in every class that you're taking and, and also what are your majors in terms of how is this impacting on AI? So am I being prepared for the future in terms of these jobs? If you're just gonna write yourself off, no, you, you're not gonna succeed. And again, it's called disruption for a reason. And so there should be some benefits in having these disruptive technologies you have to think a little different. There has to be, again, going back to the old uh, uh, canard in terms of a paradigm shift in terms of your level of thinking and how you approach these. That's right. Um, I'm not writing myself off, but I'm s more concerned of what would be available for me. Because as technology advances, there's less need for me in my certain field. Um, so and I'm I hate to, and I don't interrupt, I apologize. I'm so sorry to have to do that, this, to interrupt. But it is with love that I tell you I don't agree. I think that the limit for you is limitless. It's your eyes. You have to see. So whatever information you're getting, I would like to partner you with the aviation research person who's going to show you a new pair of eyes. You've got to be able to see, young man, and see the world the way it will be and not what you're reading. As the potential, if I, I could never have saw myself in a role like this. And it's limitless. And now I'm moving, going, but I want to bring everybody else with me. But to do that, it means that you have to take off the cap. That you're capping yourself. And, and you, because you can't see. Does that make sense? And, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and this is out of love, because I, I hear you. Yeah. And I, and, and I hear you as well, but you, you have to look at things a little differently in terms of you have to prepare yourself and, and education never stops. It's, a, it's an ongoing process, it's a continuation. Uh, you have to put yourself in that space. If you need a, a, a certification in something to improve upon that, you do that. But also, you have to look at things uh, in terms of a team, you know, and, and I don't have any, I can hire a good person to work with me and if I see somebody, I don't have a problem working with people who are smarter than I am. If I'm a good manager, I know that I have to tap that talent to be able to succeed in order to be able to sustain my company and make sure that it grows. Right. So it's just, I, I, I think about things a little different. Let me say this, Josh is one of my students and he is totally cerebral all the time. And so I know that this is gonna, he's gonna take what you're saying and it, it's going to filter down for him later, but I, I see what's going on here. Um, but he's, he's asking very good questions, there, so there, there, there's no pushback. He's saying we're in class, yeah. said it's out of love, mm -hmm. and we have a genuine concern too. If we don't ask the hard questions as students in terms of faculty, how are we being prepared? Now, if you're in aviation science, right. you're, that's, your, your, your instructors should be challenged, uh, how they innovate, how they update the curriculum, all right, in terms of to be able to meet with the market demands and how you see the future, in terms right. of that should be a part of the discussion that drives things, all right? You right. know, I. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded. I can learn. I learn from my students, you know, a lot of things in terms of technology, and that's the way you grow them. I keep saying, push them, young man. Right. You know, we and, and smarts here yeah. and here, have they have to connect. To follow know? up on what you yeah. were trying to tell them about, I hear them asking, okay, particularly Josh, like, what can I do? I had a situation where I was calling the role last year, which, which was my first year here as an adjunct, and uh, because our student body is so diverse, culturally and ethnically, there were tons of names that I could not pronounce, okay? So, and I had a class of about 100 students. So it was taking very long to go through the classroom. And then I had a student in computer science that came up to me later and said, you know, Dr. Sherrod, I think we have something for you. I said, really? He said, yeah, some buddies of mine who are also computer science students, we're working on an app. <laughs> where students can take a password, you give them a password at the beginning of the class, you're familiar with this not that. Yeah. They give, I give them a password, they enter the password on their app, on their phone, and then that registers them as present that day. And I didn't have to 
See, he has the app on his phone. It's roll call. It's, it's every day. So it's roll call. And so there's a rolling password daily. Right. And so each day the password changes. Right. And, and That's awesome. They got so excited about it. They were even asking, That's right. Can I get a password today? Amazing. It was yes. amazing. So, so, so yeah. the, someone solved a problem. And it was a student. This <laughs> is amazing to me. That, that's where we're at. Mentor. Yeah, and it's an example exactly of what you're ah, talking about. It's amazing. But, but, but I'll, I'll say this to Josh, and, uh, and I tell the students all the time, you know, you have to think of uh, things in terms of collaboration and working with other people. And there's also I always use make a friend before you need a friend. And I'm in government. I know a lot of people who work for the, for the, for the city, and I guarantee you I can pick up a phone <laughs> and put you in contact through the mayor's office with somebody who's out at the airport where you can see these things in real time where you don't have to read about them. And I know you may have an internship program, but again, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just a college professor if I don't make the necessary connections for my students to be able to put them in the right place so that they can be able to see the changing world around them. So again, uh, make a friend before you need a friend, collaboration and meet good people. And that's why I have Trish here on campus today and I reached out immediately. As you can tell, it was almost in real time. I was excited. Right. Yeah, so. Please. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say something about um, what he was worried about. Um, I feel like there's a business aspect of, for it as well. Um, meaning, if so if he's uncomfortable with an artificial intelligent robot flying an pl airplane full of people, um, there must be other people out there who are also uncomfortable with that. So on a business standpoint of things, you could create your own airline and um, point towards the fact that you are going to have actual human beings in the cockpit um, and that will you know attract more um, customers you know That's what I would say even before then you know what I would say even before then and, and I love your ideas what I would say even before then because that's bold, hefty, and almost, you can't go create your own airline. I, you know, again, I try to, I try to make sure we, we also level set for what can you do today? What can you do now? There are three things that if I didn't have them, um, there's no way I could navigate through society. Uh, number one, you have to have a good mentor person and and it's a team and like you said earlier academic so someone like a dr. Adams who has just this breadth of, of brilliant knowledge about everything dealing with from government I've talked to you and you but it spans what exactly and oh go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry yeah no, what this exactly is, is your um Occupation. Yeah, I'm the chairman of the political science department here at Texas Southern oh, University. Here. I'm on the fourth floor. Okay. And also, I run uh, a graduate program, the uh, Executive Master's of Public Administration program. Okay. Because yeah. that's, that's first is is a team, right? So it's there. It's someone who's in tech who does AI. So you could easily look up your. Uh, you have a professors here that I saw that do in the computer science area. And they are very focused on artificial intelligence and all that. So it's it's reaching out to that group and saying, I'm really interested. I think the collaboration thing is something we don't do as well as we should. But that is my life. My life is filled with a team of people everywhere I go that I pull information from. And that's still to this day. The second big thing, research. <laughs> I am an avid, just hypo learner, hyper connected learner. Like that, you said that earlier is you got the, that knowledge and you're getting a lot. Now you have to apply that to the research of the future. And so I stay with what researchers, I, I subscribe to these sites that are researchers and they actually will lay the land, uh, you know, kind of what the future looks like and pair that up. And then the final thing, right, is, and this all goes back to the people around you, is really tapping in and finding um, that third wheel of a mentor that really becomes a big motivator that also can check uh, and validate and bounce your ideas off of so that you're progressing. You know, you don't want these ideas to be in your head. They need to be action. You need to be creating something. If you don't have something on mobile, you, you need an app. You need to be creating your own world of solutions. 
those three things together, and again, it still goes back to kind of the people that you're surrounding yourself, you'd be surprised at the acceleration of, of the things that you want to bring to bear to the market that, that it can all happen and be made true. And, and I, it's funny because I talk to so many young people who they'll just say they just kind of, they're alone at, you know, you're like the only aviation person, you're really the main person in your group that you deal with every day, you don't really have that. So I encourage you guys to start building an ecosystem of people in the role uh, that you can spend one month, 30 minutes, you don't need a lot of time, and then other folks around you and build a team of folks that you could hit the market with running. Does that, does that resonate? What are the names of the videos that you guys are what are the names of the videos you guys are about to play? Because I have to leave early, and I want to watch them. Anyway, we can make them available. Though. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make this whole presentation available to you, and then however you guys post things, the links will be in there. Okay. And, and also, what was your name again? Media Just so I can one. go to your um, page and probably find that. Yeah, I was going to tell uh, Julian to give you a, a Twitter account and also the Instagram. We'll share all this stuff and Facebook. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, thank thank you all so much. Jillian, I'll post, uh, I'll give this uh, over to Jillian. Dr. Yeah. Jillian, I'll, I'll give it to Dr. Adams and then it'll have, oh, Jillian, uh, is that, yeah, yeah, right, right there. Well, all right. It's thank such you. a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, I know that we are, I don't even know that. Yeah, it's time is approaching one o'clock. Yeah, it's almost one o'clock, so. Uh, we can keep going, take a quick break. Um, it's up to you guys, but we can continue. Captive audience. I Go love ahead. it. I think he has a question. Why? My role is a global role, it's a worldwide role, um, and it's all leading edge, so it's everything we've been talking about. It's mixed reality, AI, and cognitive, it's blockchain, it's all of these, everything, conversational bots. So I, I'm an architect uh, and lead a book of business, and so travel all over the world, different industries that are customers that are infusing all these into their applications. That's why I said it's not just robots. They're infusing it into their actual business, all of these things. So yeah, I travel. Oh yes, 100%. And uh, yeah, there are things that we could leverage data for to potentially become predictive in a lot of those. Uh, so we don't have all the cameras, all the senses, and all that in Austin. But if we did, there are things that would be able to pick up those things, even in, in the mail room. So. Ah, so she saw, yeah. That's a stickier one, yeah. So we would have to probably have a whole nother conversation on counterterrorism. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, counterterrorism is what that's a counterterrorism technologies and platforms. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. <coughs> My name is Lorenzo Calloway. I'm a former alumni from this school, um, engineering. And I came here because I saw Trice's post on the LinkedIn. I wanted to come in and have a kind of conversation. I think we've kind of connected via, so, yeah. Yeah, I thought I recognized you. So, just a quick heads up. Um, I got a double E from here. Um, I spent a vast majority of my career in oil and gas. I uh, spent about 16 years at NASA managing the, the ISS and the Orion program. I stood both of those programs up, $2 billion programs I was managing and running. So <clears throat> I said that to you all to say that I'm a living example of where you all are. And you may not know where you're going to be in the next three to five years specifically, but what is value added is to ensure that you take advantage of all the technology you can incorporate into your skill mix. A big part of that, certainly from a, from a director level, executive level, I'm looking for a set of skills, and I'm also looking for energy. Because the arena that she, Trice is talking about, we're moving that direction. There's no reversing that. The ITO, the Internet of Things, all these things that are separately running and, and running in a silo, we're connecting. Now, from a NASA perspective, <clears throat> some of you may be familiar with a term called Six Sigma. Anybody? Okay, so from that standpoint, we're talking about three signals on the ideal perfect line. The perfect line being a straight line, three sigma on each side. 
the, ne the, <coughs> the NASA build, <coughs> the NASA build is from six to nine nines in terms of design build processes, the whole gamut. So what we've been doing at NASA is what AI and everybody else is trying to incorporate into their business model, which is what they're talking about here. So is your background mechanical, did you say? Aviation. Aviation? Okay. So, so even though AI is coming into the, into, the, uh, into the model, business model, it doesn't alleviate all the various avenues that you have to now support, you know, writing code, algorithms, integration of assets, uh, translate assets. All these things are, it's just, I mean, what happens is the more we do AI, the wider this thing becomes, the more opportunities start to take place, and the job you thought you were going to do physically or be in the critical path as a human asset, you have other opportunities and other trends of the marketplaces opening up because we're advancing the ball. So in order for you to be successful, and this is just my, from my perspective, there's always a good reason to say why I could fail. But you can't be afraid to fail. Failing is what allows you to go forward and be successful. So it's important that you realize that you surround yourself with people like I heard several times networking. Networking is critical. I mean, I left NASA did some consulting. So I'm now with, the, with, the, with one of the largest consulting firms on the globe, with Accenture. So I came in, and uh, we're doing a ton of different things in this space. I happen to be in what we call Industry X.0, which is the next level of integration. I'm involved in that. I've got tons of clients I'm putting in the critical path. And that opens up a ton of assets for managing assets. And here's one quick question for you, or more of a statement. Most companies, big companies, you think it's Exxon Mobil, and that's who Exxon Mobil is. Within Exxon Mobil are multiple companies, and they're not connected. You may think they're connected, but the integration does not exist. So as you create an opportunity to optimize your systems, what you end up doing is monetizing that, because they have so much waste, you actually make that system more efficient, and you pull the waste out of that wasteful system and apply it in other technologies. So again, my word is a word of encouragement to all of you. I mean, I'm here because I saw this stuff on the web. I want to come out and meet the professor uh, and uh, see what we can do in terms of bridging some, bridging some opportunities for uh, Accenture to maybe come in and uh, look at some of the, the talent that's here and uh, maybe uh, pluck a few of you guys out of here, potentially. Uh, so that's, we'll see. That's important. Which yeah. is why, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, very glad to yeah, know you're Accenture. That's awesome. Um, so let's, let's, we're going to do something. I'm probably going to share a couple of videos. You want to do that? And then we then start to really move this towards this next political season. Uh, so I asked a question earlier, and I don't think I got an answer. What, what's your major out of curiosity? You just walked in. What's your major? Okay. Oh, come here, because you're, yeah, you're one of my, my people, too, because that's, that whole thing is transforming. What do you guys, and again, I'm not talking about ideology, so not political, Democrat, I'm not talking about that. What are you seeing that's shaping your perception about, do you vote? Do you all vote? Raise your hand if you, you vote. Are you passionate about voting? Do you understand the implication if you don't? Okay. Um, do you, do you? Okay. Okay. Um, I just need your perception. Okay, do any of you watch the news? No, so you don't watch the news. Do you know what CNN? Social media. Do you know what CNN is? Uh, you've heard of CNN. <laughs> um, you have heard of Fox and all the different news, right? Okay. Are you impacted at all by what's happening around you? In anybody? Y young people. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to get to, because I couldn't get you guys to answer this question earlier. The question was, how are you being influenced by our politicians, by, your, by media? How, what is influencing your mind, where you get your information from, your data from, to help you make a decision about who you're gonna support? 
This is not about technology. This is your heart. What are you seeing? Or, or do you like the direction of this country? I want to know your personal opinion about what's going on around you. Health care, poverty. What, are you OK with this country the way it is today? OK, uh, I think we had a mic. It's not, it's not based upon uh, morals, I think it's immoral. I think that uh, it's dishonest. I also feel as though uh, it needs, I, I don't agree with the structure of the government. Uh, I, I don't agree with that anymore. I think that it's all, uh, it's being manipulated by business, it's being bought. I don't think it's really for the people. I think it's for the few. So uh, I watch CNN a lot. It's one of my main stations, and I think that they give a, a a good perspective of what's going on. I'm opposed to Fox. The media on Fox is, is it leans toward the right. Um, I think that uh, some people will feel that CNN leans toward the left, but. I think they give us a viewpoint of what's really going on. Overall, I think the government, um, the, the, the federal government, especially the president, he doesn't represent any of the morals and values that I was raised on. Uh, he's not for people. He's selfish. And I think that a lot of the people that voted for him uh, were important their interests. As far as, you know, I, I think that it's very important that people know their interests before they go out and vote. Um, I talk to my kids, I have some kids uh, that are in the 20s, and uh, they fail to understand the political process and how it works. I struggle with them uh, to try to influence them to vote. I have two that don't vote. They say it doesn't matter. So uh, overall... That's what I'm trying to get, and thank you for that, because uh, it goes back to... Uh, yep, go ahead. I want to ask my question. Excuse me. And it's, it's under the heading of political efficacy. Uh, what are you doing to effectuate change? And do you feel that, given the fact that you disagree with the structure of the government, uh, that you as an individual can actually impact on it? So I'm, I'm putting up, posing this question to, to you. Right. You're asking me what am I doing? Yeah, you, you're dissatisfied with it. Yeah, what, what are you doing if uh, it's called political efficacy to effectuate change? Do you have, think you have the ability from an individual standpoint or do you feel that you said that you disagree with the structure of the government? So uh, what, what are you doing? What initiatives are you taking to, to bring about change? Or do you feel that you have the ability to, to effectuate change? To answer your question first, I, I feel that I definitely have the ability uh, to change. What am I doing personally? Uh, I'm trying to position myself to where as I have more of a voice and an influence. Um, I start with my family. Um, from a macro perspective as far as going in, I have an aspiration if I'm able to uh, live a little longer, I want to get into government um, at a local level. Um, that's some goals that I have. Uh, I'm learning more about the process. I'm in Dr. Sherrod's uh, class. A lot of the information I'm already familiar with. I'm, I'm a more mature student, so I've been out in the world a little bit and I've seen some things. So, uh, and, and, and my question is it's not, not intended I'm to be negative, but uh, have you considered running for local office <laughs> or, or for a state office? Actually, um, I'm considering running for one of the local offices in my, in my, in my city yeah. that I'm from. And, and this is why I asked this question. So here's why I asked this question. There is a new citizen it's called the omnipresent citizen, right? The citizen that's, that, that has a lot of knowledge, all-knowing. I ask this for a reason. Uh, and this is going to get into some of the other things that are going to bring it all back. Because there's a difference between, uh, and this is what I see from this generation, emotion of what we see, uh, and then data. If we were to collect all the data coming from um, our 
the White House, coming from Senate, coming from Congress, and say, okay, we had 30 decisions in one day that were made. These decisions, uh, you categorize them and say, did they impact my social life? Did they impact my education, my, my education? Did it impact, what did these policies impact? And then you start to research, to understand, as an accountant, these policies that are being passed by this current presidential, uh, by this current administration, what are they? And then you start to document and capture that in a way that you, you can, again, intelligence. It's building this intelligent citizen of the 21st century. So that now you have a trend of information to say four years ago there were policies about the environment that were going to allow us to uh, you know, realize certain uh, opportunities in our environment, point system, you know, the whole thing that we were uh, headed toward. And now there are things happening to undo some of those policies. What's the impact? And what I'm trying to do is to help us understand how we should be using the mobile and data on the mobile so that we start to study the patterns of what's happening and have a different kind of conversation. So I knew that conversation was going to come because typically our conversations are about what we don't like, about the administration and the things that are frustrating because by design it's meant to keep us distracted. How do we unlock the distraction? so that we are able now to start looking at the data to empower our, our industry to do something different. And that's why I wanted to know what your personal opinion is about what's happening in, in what you're seeing, how you're getting information. And thank you for that because we're gonna unlock and enlighten some things as well because I agree you know, you're the way you see things. But how do we help this generation to use all of the resources around them to start to intelligently document and capture what's happening in this society? Because I think they're going to see a lot more. And we have to separate how we feel with, with in all that getting getting a really good context and understanding. That's what we're going to try to unlock and unpeel today. Uh, I mean, like, like you say, like you say a lot of this stuff happening is like a distraction and stuff like that. So that's why I don't really watch the politicians and stuff like that because the things they do would never make me successful in life. So I just like really focus on myself and like the resources that I need to better myself. That's what I use. And, I, and the danger, really so, so this is the extreme. The, this is where we are and where I've, this is why I've been doing what I've been doing, why I think we need this. The extremes. One, we see CNN all the time and we pay attention to CNN all the time. And not everything on CNN, just like everything on Fox. It's, it's the way that they decide to our minds, and it may be balanced, but if we're not going to the source of information and getting it and documenting it for ourselves, and then here you are operating in a silo to a certain degree, because we haven't made an inclusive path for you to enter into knowledge. Instead, we give you distractions. I'm with you, and I'm with you. I almost have to do both. Actually, when I call my grandmother every day, and she's watching CNN from the time she gets up to the time she goes to bed, we're distracted as a society. And see, innovation, no, no, not you. The broader group of our folks that I walk into the household are watching what's happening every day and paying attention, which is why 
ratings continue to increase, what I'm saying is we have to be careful because innovation and being able for us to solve problems comes when we can talk to each other without the distraction of anger, of frustration. In my day, I'm like you. I can't have anything on my brain when I wake up in the morning. I can't do my job. So, so sometimes I can't know. But the danger of that is that you got to know. That's what we have to figure out how to unlock. And I'm so sorry, young lady, because you've been waiting. Oh, it's OK. Um, I feel like, as far as a younger perspective, I'm 19 years old. And <laughs> so I feel like a lot of people my age try and remove themselves. Because I feel like the more knowledge you know, you start to review the world. You become critical of every piece of information that you take in. And so it's like, if I watch TV, if I absorb all this knowledge, if I absorb all this information, now I think about when I was in elementary school and it's like I'm researching and I'm learning well if they were lowering the standards you know for the children in the neighborhoods that I grew up in so that's why when I went to college and I went to Howard it was a lot more difficult for me because I wasn't even on standard I wasn't even on par so I was excelling but I was excelling to a lower standard so that the state of Mississippi could continue getting their grant money so it's, I feel like a lot of people remove themselves like they are afraid of the knowledge because the more knowledge you get you become critical of things around you and it's like you can't be at peace because everything is you know too much it's like when you when one person says something it's like now you know how this directly affects you and so it just kind of puts you at an unrest and so I think that's why a lot of younger people are like they're not as into the news or wanting to know more because Knowledge is powerful, and it can make you feel powerful, and it makes you want to do things. And if you don't know how you can get those things done, it can become frustrating. So you just said it, and I know that you're going to be going next. You just said it. This is what I've been trying to unlock, a pathway for you to have people in your life who are going to guide and shepherd and harness all the power that you own on your mobile phone because it is powerful and instead of shutting it down and trying to navigate on your own or instead of the people around you saying I don't want to know because when I know I have no outlet and someone to harness you know back in the day we had a I remember we used to go to the free park it was all kind of parks all kind of stuff where we had people that were there that we could talk to at that time that we're there to help harness and shepherd. In this digital era, who do you go to? To help you know if what you're thinking is right so that you can move on to the next thing, so that you can rest at night and sleep and innovate. We're gonna come back another time and we are gonna host something different to help us to unlock all of this because you need knowledge, you need news, you need information, and you need people that are gonna help you have an outlet to grow. So keep that passion and keep that in mind because it's so much to unload and unlock that you just stated, but we are so happy that you're here because look how much value you added uh, just by showing up. Thank you. My name is Roderick Haynes. I'm an alumnus from uh, Texas Southern University. Thank you. And I work at Microsoft with Ms. Johnson. <laughs> and of course, I had to come and support her. And um, as usual, she's ahead of the game. I was able, you were going, you actually hit on all the categories where I was going to, I was going to reach. Because um, to your point, when you mentioned that the, the, the disinformation that you have to deal with turns you off, and the young man down at the very front, where he says he just he's just focused on his in his silo to, to focus on himself. Those are challenging, and the way I have and, and you asked what are we doing, and I wanted to answer that question. You pretty much said what we should do, but I, I'm gonna speak so it, it can be very um, relevant for those of us who have a circle of influence on their kids. I have two kids that well, I have four, but two of them are grown, and two one in college, one just graduated. We come to our house first Sunday every, every month for dinner. And one of the things I do is I tell everybody, put their cell phones in a basket, put it to the side, we eat, we laugh, we talk, and we always get to two places, right? One, what's on TV, and my wife and my daughters talk about what happened on Scandal. Then we get to the real stuff where we talk about um, politics. Because if it's not 
relevant to them, we in trouble. So the only, I think for me, I, only can, I can only influence so much, so many people at a time. So my kids, their wives, their, their husbands and, and their significant others, we eat at the table and we have that conversation. And what I hear out of my kids, they repeat what their peers say. So you, it's so much information, and of course data is the new currency. It's so much information out there. It's overwhelming to, to the youth because they, they're inundated with their cell phones. My son now is, um, he works at Accenture Avenue, right? And I used to work at Accenture as well until I, I moved on to uh, uh, Microsoft. And the reason he got involved in uh, IT is because he realized when he was in college, he, he finally picked up and got the revelation from me about technology. When he was in a class and he noticed that everybody was looking at their cell phone. And he wrote a paper on it. And then he was, he was caught up in how social media impacts everyone. So within this social media age where information is constantly pushed to, to, to everyone, it's hard to decipher what's relevant and what's not. And it takes, just like you said earlier, adults who can, who can um, splice and, 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 and pull out what's relevant. And some of the things that I do at my home, and I'm going to make it real quick, probably too late, um, is I ask my kids, who are you going to vote for? And of course, they all say, I'm, well, I'm going to vote Democrat. And I, you know, they know my, probably most, most of my life, I've always voted conservative, right? Except for when uh, uh, Mr. Obama took, took office. And I told them it's not about the party. Look at what the party is doing for you. And if you don't know, do your research because the data is there. And, if you, and, and hopefully you have adults in your life or mentors, teachers, professors, doctors who can, you can ask those relevant questions to and say, look, this is what I understand. Because everything that you hear from this president, you, you're not going to see in their policies. You're not going to see in the policy that they're, they're being passed every day. You're not going to see it. Fortunately, my cousin is in, is in that administration. And he was able to influence something positive. And I guarantee you this president don't even know it happened. My, my cousin is Leonard Haynes III. And he's in a, he is working as Assistant Secretary of Education for the United States. And he wrote a, he wrote, he wrote a bill. That he, and, he, and, and of course, Trump got in front and was, you know, was, 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 was photo-opping everything from all these black pr uh, presidents, where he, he actually forgave the Katrina bill. People don't know that. So when, when we're voting, we're voting with emotion. Because he's going out to his base to get them fired up. They don't even know what they're voting for. 90% of what they vote, they vote on emotion and some of the buffoonery that he puts out there in, in social media. I suggest that you do the extra step in looking at what policies are being passed versus what's being socialized on the media. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was right on time. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what this is all about. It's an open forum. This is what this is about. And I know that you would appreciate that more than anything is that we have to look at policy. This is right on time. Uh, and I was going to say the politics is about symbolism. It's the symbolic uses of politics. That's what we say. And I, that was going to be my response to the young man before he left is that there's always an appeal to a base. And you have to understand the processes of government. You're absolutely correct in terms of the policy-making component. It's in the legislative body for most of the stuff. And the president, he can articulate, he can lead in terms of proposals, but it's up to Congress to adopt the policies. But also we have to, to read and to educate ourselves. There's so many other reforms that could be made in, this, in the system. We're still using the Electoral College where we could go to a popular vote to elect the president. Uh, we don't have to be all bent out of shape about a Supreme Court if we simply expand the size of the Supreme Court. There's nothing prevent, preventing that. But I can go on and on and on in terms of That's some good, of these reforms. But we, we have to educate ourselves in terms of the politics and how it impacts on us. But I'm not going to give that lecture today. I'm going to let Margaret, who's my smart. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll just start to teach for him. <laughs> so we can start, wrap, probably start to wrap up because I know that we've lost quite a few. Um, and we had until three, uh, the questions that you guys asked about all this whole new world of data, this whole new world of how AI, us being able to, I know that you might have missed uh, some of it, but that's okay. We'll have, we can have an offline discussion. But is there anything else that is on your heart that you feel before we start to wrap up that is important to you? And Roderick, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for saying that because it, it all goes back to validate the importance of getting knowledge and getting context. Is there something you wanted to, uh, th I think this gentleman here? Or, no, oh I, no, I was going to tell okay. him to, to be encouraged and what I was trying to do in terms of, we say all politics is local and if you're considering impact and at the local level because believe it or not, a lot of the federal policies, uh, they, they may have an impact but they're not going to impact on you. They're making sure that the buses run on time, that the garbage is picked up on time and you're more likely to know someone on city council where you can establish a relationship, you can actually influence policy, or you can know a state representative. And I, and I would like, uh, and I have a lot of people in the, uh, uh, in the state legislature, and normally we have the, uh, the Legislative Black Caucus, and I would like to do one of the forums, they have this big, big deal, we can do it on artificial intelligence and how good. it impact on, I think I can get that, that proposal. That would and be where you, if you would come back, that's in January when the legislature goes into Yeah, I was, I was impressed by all the AI questions that everybody was asking. I, I, I was deeply impressed with how much uh, the students all here knew and understand uh, about the power of intelligence and machines. And so um, we'll, our next goal yeah. is to host, uh, so Roderick for years, uh, is to host a political hackathon. Sometime, we're gonna try sometime in January. And this time it'll go out to, um, all the students will do a lot of advertising and all that good stuff. And uh, but that's our next, I think we're not gonna stop on this. Um, but yes, Miss Margaret. Well, one thing I want to say, I can't thank you enough for being here. Dr. Adams was sitting in the This is the best you can do for the morning. I've been here a long time. I agree. And, um, and Dawn and Josh, it was here. In the I think I had about eight or nine students that came out. And I wanted you to know that, um, that you were competing with Texas Southern University and Southern University. Yeah. Is that today? today? That's the football yeah. game, yes. Yeah, so. I was going to tell you afterwards. In their first yeah. cotton ball class in Dallas. <laughs> so, you know, you could be talking about, yeah. they could have had Beyonce here, yeah. and they would not have shown up. I will be back. So the reason that I did this today and why it had to happen today, um, there's a nonprofit, I think I said earlier, TWEF, that encouraged everybody to have one day of giving back, a global day of purpose. And she's like, well, what will you do with your day of purpose? And I said, well, I don't care if it's one, two, three people in a room. We've got to get a pulse on how is it that we can get data driven with what's happening around us in our political community and getting people inspired, entrepreneurship and all the other things that we need to be doing and I needed a pulse so we just went ahead and plowed through this, it's streaming so the great thing is that it is, on, it is on, online um, so for us if we have a big online community and then a few folks here but we now know this is a button I think we we will end up doing this again soon. Probably sooner than later. We'll have to. You'll give me a date, and then I'll have Roger up, and uh, and we'll come back out and do this for a bigger audience. Without the, we'll pick a date that uh, that you feel is necessary. But I think that this we just hit on something. What do you think? Oh, I, I think absolutely it works out well. Um, and I would just like to say thank you on the behalf of the, uh, uh, the students and also the faculty at Texas Southern University. I hope that we've made a favorable impression on you in terms of where we are. And I know there's some consideration with other HBCUs that there's a consortium or anything to be established that you would understand that we're in the vanguard on these issues. And certainly uh, I welcome the opportunity to work further and to collaborate for the interests of our students at Texas Southern to make sure that they're in this space where they can take advantage of many of the changes that are taking place in AI 
and also in data-driven decisions that we should be a part of. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.